Hebrews chapter 10, we're continuing in our study um, here in the book of Hebrews. We've been looking at it, and we're actually, right now, we're just a little bit past halfway. We're almost exactly halfway. It depends on how it all breaks out, but we're about halfway through. We've, we've been going through the book of Hebrews, and, and I love the book of Hebrews. The more I study it, the more I love it. The more we dig things out of it, the, the more it's, uh, boy, I'll tell you what, it's very, you know, all of God's word is relevant. Right. Some folks, they try to say, well, it's just not relevant for today. It's relevant for today, and if you will study it, and you'll let the Holy Spirit of God speak to you, he'll give you what you need that day. It is relevant, and there's so much that we look at. Man, it brings such joy as we study through here the book of Hebrews, and uh, we're trying to dig in and get everything the Lord has for us in this book, the, the book of Hebrews. And I want to just do a little review before we read through our, our scripture here tonight, but I want us to look here. Um, it, tonight we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 18 here in chapter number 10 of Hebrews, but let me just do a little bit of review and uh, we've been doing a lot of reminding as we go through this, and, and uh, once again, it's been several weeks since we've looked at Hebrews, so I just want to remind us that there are two main purposes of this particular letter, this, this epistle that was written. It was written to the Hebrew Jewish Christians, and uh, it seems that some of them were perhaps on the verge of going back to Judaism. If we remember, as we've read and we've studied, there were, there, many of them were thinking about going back, and so the writer of Hebrews, he's writing them, he's urging them, don't go back. And so this book, it has literally two purposes. Number one, his purpose is to show the superiority of the Lord Jesus Christ. It just keeps getting better and better. Jesus is better. It's been the theme here through the book of Hebrews that we've been looking at. Literally, he talks about the superiority. He talks about the excellency of Christ. The word better, it occurs many times throughout the book. And in, in, in that vein, he wants them to understand that they don't need to go back to what they were at or where they were at or what they were doing or how they were worshiping. There's nothing, by the way, to go back to, he says. He's trying to get them to see that. Hey, we could apply that same thing today to believers who may be tempted to go back into the old world. There's nothing to go back to. A person that gets saved and born again, child of God, hey, don't go back to what you used to be. There's nothing to go back to. There's nothing worth that's going back to in this old world. Listen, if you've come out of the world to the Lord Jesus Christ, everything that you have in Jesus is superior to anything this old world has to offer. Praise God. Hey, listen, you don't need to go back to the world. The world has nothing to offer you but bondage. Nothing to offer you but literally death. Don't go back to that. I love that song. I've sang the song before. I remember singing it growing up in a song that it's uh, the world. The, the song is, the, I'd rather have Jesus. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. I say amen to that. Hey, Jesus is better than anything this world could give you. There's nothing in this world that can compare to what Jesus Christ has given me in my life. I don't regret it one bit. I don't regret living in the lifestyle of a Christian, living the life of, of being a child of God and having peace in my heart. Hey, I'm thankful for that. I'm satisfied with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so here he, he's exalting the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he also is writing a word of encouragement to them. And very soon we're going to get through what we have been studying in terms of basic doctrine that's been presented here. And we're going to be making a shift over to some practical, a practical encouragement, a practical section of encouragement. As a matter of fact, we've, we've used this verse before that, that talks about this word of encouragement. Uh, Hebrews 13, verse 22, um, as he's coming to the conclusion of the letter, he says this. Notice it on the screen. He says there, and I beseech you, brethren, suffer. Or, or listen patiently. Listen to what I'm saying to you. Listen patiently. He says the word of exhortation. For I have written a letter unto you in a few words. And so he's saying this is a word of encouragement, a word of exhortation. The word was a uh, exhortation. And so he's exhorting these believers not only to not go back, but he's also exhorting them to go on and be all that God has saved you to be. That same thing can be true for us. God wants us to move on and be all that God wants us to be. We don't need to live like we used to live. Be, be all that God wants you to be. God, He has great plans for your life. God has a special purpose for your life. God, God has something special for you in the year of 2013. Move on to that. Go on and be everything God has saved you to be. That's the setting of this book. He's building the case. He's showing the superiority and the utter sufficiency of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we've looked and we've seen, as we've studied the book of Hebrews, we saw that he pointed out that Jesus, in Jesus, we have a better person, number one. He was better than the prophets. He was better than the angels. He was better than Moses. He is a better person. 
And then he talked about the fact that Jesus, in Jesus, we have a better priest, better than the Old Testament priests. They, they had an earthly priest. They had a series of priests. They had an earthly high priest. But now that what we have in Jesus Christ, we don't need a priest here on earth. We literally are priests. We can go very, to the very throne of God through Jesus Christ, our mediator, or our high priest. We don't have a high priest here on earth. Jesus Christ is our high priest. And so Jesus is better not only in his person, but he's better in his priesthood. He has moved from that now to the next emphasis, which is the Lord Jesus Christ is better in his provision. His provision. The sacrifice which Jesus made at Calvary is better than what they had in the Old Testament. You see, if you have a Christian and, and, uh, and they've been around church for any time at all, they've heard the reference made to the finished work of Christ. Maybe you've heard that doctrine or you've heard that teaching. That's something, that terminology that, that you should be familiar with, the finished work of Jesus Christ. What's that talking about? It's talking about what Jesus Christ did on Calvary. It's a finished work. It was completed there on Calvary. His death was a sacrifice and which was a finished work. You know what? It doesn't have to be improved upon. We don't have to improve upon what Christ did on Calvary. We don't have to add to it somehow. We don't have to get baptized with waters with some kind of work salvation to add to what Christ did on Calvary. Hey, listen, it doesn't have to be improved upon. Also, it doesn't have to be repeated. I praise God for that. It was something that was done, and it's superior to anything that's done before, and our salvation solidly, solidly rests upon the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't have to worry about if, if it's going to move or if it's going to change. It's an absolute that is a firm foundation that my salvation, that your salvation rests upon. And so the emphasis of this chapter really is encapsulated here in, in chapter 10 and verse number 10. Let's go ahead and read these verses. We'll get to verse number 10 here in a moment. But notice there, if you would, Hebrews chapter 10. Look at verse number 1. <clears throat> I love these verses, man. If you, if you don't get anything out of these verses tonight, something's wrong with you. You better wake up. This is some good stuff. I, man, I, this is like eating. I mean, after dinner, you have that pecan pie with some ice cream on the side. I mean, it's so good. This is like that tonight. This is one of those kind of messages. You're going to love it. It says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then... Would they not have ceased to be offered? Because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. I'm sorry, man. This, this, this is just, if you understand what these words are saying, it, it really, it's heavy. It, I say it's heavy because it's so good. It's so good. Notice there, verse 4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore? When he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me, To do thy will, O God. Above, when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offerings for sin thou wouldest not, neither hast pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds, and I will write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember. What does it say? No more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we're thankful tonight, Lord, for the salvation that you've given to us, for forgiveness of sins, Lord, for the cleansing, Lord, for the weight lifted, Lord, for there being no more guilt. We've been washed, 
we've been made clean. Lord, we thank you for the price that was paid there on Calvary, that you died for us. You paid that price once for all. Lord, we praise you and thank you for it. Lord, I pray that we might worship you tonight. Lord, that our hearts would praise you and thank you. Lord, that we would understand what you've done for us and how great you are, how awesome you are. Lord, we thank you for who you are. We praise you tonight. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, I want you to look at verse number 10. Notice what it says there. It says, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. What does it say? Once for all. Once for all. Where was the body of Jesus Christ offered? Where was it offered? Help me out. On Calvary. Right there on that cross. That's exactly right. On the cross, when he died, he died as a sacrifice once for all. Hey, that's the great theme of this verse that we're going to be considering and looking at tonight. The once for all sacrifice of Christ. The finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross for our sins. You see, he's discussing this and in so doing, he's going to contrast what we have in Christ and his finished work and the Old Testament system of sacrifices and show why we don't have the system of sacrifices today. Hey, when you came to church today, did you see that there was some uh, fire out front, there was some burning, and there was a place there where animals were slain, and there was, I mean, they were on the sacrifice, and you smelt the smell of, of burning flesh, and you saw blood that was shed? I mean, did you see any of that walking in tonight? I didn't. Praise the Lord. Praise God. We don't have to do that. Praise the Lord that we came in here tonight, and listen, what we have in Christ is far superior to any of that. What we have in Christ is far superior to being under the law. There are so many religions today that are trying to continue those exact same rituals and those exact same things. They're living underneath the law. Many Christians today, they call themselves Christians. They say that they are following after Christ, and yet they're following after the law. They're still in bondage. Hey, what we have in Christ delivers us from that bondage. We don't have to live that way any longer. We don't have to, 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 to have that system any longer. And the reason is, is that we have a Christ that is superior to all of that. What Christ did is a once for all that completely filled everything that it was intended to convey. And so he's talking about the once for all sacrifice of Christ. The first thing that he does in the first four verses is shows us how the once for all sacrifice is expected. In the Old Testament, it was expected. There was looking forward to what you and I enjoy today. They were expecting it. They were looking forward to it. And he says in these opening statements that those Old Testament sacrifices, they literally, they were a shadow of good things to come. They weren't the very image or the reality of those things. They were a shadow. Now let me ask you, what is a shadow? Is that reality of me? I mean, is that really me back there, that shadow? When you look at a shadow, uh, you know, imagine it, it, it's an image that, that's cast by an object. Light shines on it. It casts a shadow of myself. You, you walk along, you see your shadow. The body casts a shadow. And, and it's a representative of reality. And so he's saying the Old Testament sacrifices, they were shadows. But they were not the real thing. They weren't the real thing. They were just shadows of something that was on the way. A shadow is something that can't do anything, by the way. That shadow back there, it can't do anything. Oh, this is a shadow. A shadow of a key can't open a door, can it? Nope. A shadow of a beautiful Thanksgiving turkey meal can't feed a hungry family. Can't do it. It's just a shadow of it. It's not the real thing. It's just a shadow. It's a representation of a reality. And so he's saying uh, the Old Testament sacrifices, they were shadows. They were not the real thing, just shadows of what was to come. And, and so it, it, you understand, a shadow of a cross can't pay the price. It can't. It took the real thing. It took Jesus Christ hanging on that cross. And so he's trying to say, why hold on to a shadow when you have the reality in Jesus Christ? Now, grab onto this with me tonight. I want you to imagine, uh, suppose with me for a moment that a guy is engaged, all right? He's engaged to a beautiful young lady. Are you all with me now, man? I mean, he's engaged to the most beautiful woman in the world. She's his fiance, and he has a picture to prove it. Uh, he has a picture of her. He loves that picture. He carries that picture with him everywhere that's dearest to his heart, right in his wallet, his back pocket. I'm just kidding around. 
<laughs> Some of you got it. I mean, he carries that picture with him. When he goes to bed, he looks at that picture. <laughs> Sorry, Caleb. I mean, um, but I mean, he carries that thing with him. E He's turning red now. Yeah, I mean, he carries that with him everywhere he goes. He loves that picture. He can't, hey, he can't be without that picture. Well, the day finally comes. Okay, their fiancé, right? They're engaged. The day finally comes for the wedding. They get there, and the, the preacher says to the man, do you? And he says, I do. And he says to the, the, the bride, do you? And she says, I do. And so then they get married, right? That's how it all comes about. That's what a marriage is all about, right? They, I do, I do, I do. And then you pronounce them husband and wife. They kiss. They walk out the door. You may now kiss the bride, by the way, it says, right? Isn't that what it says? You may now. What does that mean? Ooh. Anyway, so they walk out, because before that, he was just kissing a shadow of it. It was just the, the paper. He really wasn't kissing her at that time, of course. But then they walk out together. They're married, and they're supposed to live happily ever after. That was just a side note. Anyway, so they're married now. Well, the day comes while his wife is out at the store. She comes home, and she finds a note from her husband. And the note says, Dear Charity, I have left you because I'm going back. I really miss my picture of you. I'm going to go back and I'm going to spend my time once again with that picture of you. I'm going to hold that picture. I'm going to love that picture. I'm going to have that picture because I long for the days back before we were married when I had that picture and I was able to hold that picture. And so I'm going to go back to that picture. Is that crazy or what? You think about the absurdity of that. Now don't think that it's a bad marriage I'm talking about here, all right? It's not divorce we're talking about. Here's a guy that goes back to a picture. Why in the world would you trade a picture for the real thing? I'll tell you what, when I'm gone, I'm, I go down to Ohio, I go hunting, maybe I'm gone about six days. I love seeing a picture, but I'll tell you what I like even more than that. Mm. I love walking in the house and my wife meets me at the door and puts her arms around me and gives me a great big kiss. Come on, guys. I mean, this thing, come on. Something be wrong if she didn't do that. Amen to that, right? Hey, there's one thing to look at a picture. That's wonderful. But to be able to hold her, to be able to kiss her. I know we're getting a little bit, you know. Sorry, guys. Some of you are really, wow, this is good stuff tonight. Man, I'm liking this. Settle down, Barb. All right. You know, there's nothing that's like the real thing. You know, that's the same thing when people, when they go back into bondage, they want to go back to the, the picture of Jesus Christ. They want to go back to, these Jews, they wanted to go back to practicing what was to be a shadow, a foreshadowing of what Christ was to fulfill. They wanted to go back to going through all the motions of these rituals. You know, there's a lot of religions like that today. I can go right down the line of mainstream Protestants that are following after traditions and, and they're literally following after uh, the trying to somehow receive God's grace through receiving something by maybe taking of the Lord's Supper. The Catholic Church calls it the Holy Eucharist. They believe that they're actually taking the body of Christ and drinking the blood of Christ and therefore receiving God's grace. They believe that baptism is a holy sacrament. It's a means by receiving God's grace. Hey, those two things are wonderful things, but they're not a means by receiving God's grace. They're ordinances to be obeyed because Christ commanded them, but not so we could be saved. If he had to command for us to do some work to be saved, his death on the cross would not have been once for all. We'd be adding to that. We literally be going back to the Old Testament system that it really is a convoluted idea of the Old Testament system, that a lot of these religions today. But literally, they go back to that. They have a high priest. They have a priest. They have a pope. They have a priest. They have the, the, the incense that's lit. They have these sacrifices that they do. They actually have these rituals that you go through. And it, people today, how sad it is that they literally want to go back to being in bondage. And that's what the book here of Hebrews is trying to tell the Hebrew Christians. Why do you want to go back to bondage? Why do you want to go back and do that? Why would you give up the reality for a picture of reality? Why would you do that? You see the point here tonight. Are you understanding? Are you grasping this? That's what he's trying to say in these verses. Don't go back to the Old Testament sacrifices. Hey, they were inadequate. They were not sufficient. They could not fully do the job. That's what, it means. That's what he means in verse number one when he says that they couldn't make the, the comers thereunto perfect. They couldn't do the job. 
They weren't able to do the job. They could never be fulfilled by the Old Testament sacrifices. They could never be forgiven by those. Those were just shadows looking forward to the future, to the substance of reality, which was Jesus Christ. They were all focusing toward that. And then he indicates in verse number 1 that those Old Testament sacrifices are inadequate because they were repetitive as well. They were done continually. They were repetitive. He says that they were offered year by year. It was a continual thing. They had to be offered every year. Remember on the Day of Atonement, we were studying this in, in uh, the book of Leviticus. On the Day of Atonement, the high priest, he, he would go in with the blood of the lamb and he would sprinkle that blood on the mercy seat. And he, he had to come back when? Every year he had to come back on the Day of Atonement. Every year. And instead of taking away sin, all it did was just push their sins one more year toward Calvary. And so he, th- there was a, a, a repetition about it. It was not a once for all kind of thing. It, it, was, it wasn't done one time and it was over. It was done year after year after year. And then in verse number 2, there we see that if it had been sufficient, he asked the question, wouldn't they have been uh, ceased to be offered? I mean, if it was sufficient, wouldn't they have stopped the offering? What, why did they continually do it if it was sufficient? The point was that they were not sufficient. And therefore, they had to be continually offered on a repetitive basis. And he says because of that, they had been, had been, if because of that, if they had been the worshipers, if they had been truly um, cleansed of their sin, they would have had their conscience cleansed as, as well. They would have had no more conscience of sin if that offering had been sufficient. Notice what it says there. I want you to look at it. Look at verse number 2. This is interesting. For then, they, uh, for then would, not they, would they not have ceased to be offered? Because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins? Now think about that. If your sin is purged, it says here that it, then the worshipers would have no more conscience of sin. It would no longer be on their account. There would be no more guilt. I want you to hold on to that. We're going to get back to that in a little bit. That's an awesome thing. There would be no more guilt if it was the real thing, if it was the absolute forgiveness of. And so what he's saying, in in, in one sense of the word, those Old Testament sacrifices, they really just made them feel more guilty. Now you think about that. It literally made them feel more guilty. It just brought up their sins over and over and over again. They never were cleansed. They continually were brought up over and over and over again. Let me give you an illustration to kind of help us understand this. It's kind of like you owe a debt, you can't pay it. Let's say you owe a sum of money, you can't pay it. So you go to the bank, you take out a loan for the debt that you owe that you can't pay. Does that make sense? Some people do, right? Go take out a loan for the debt they couldn't pay, and you get a friend to go with you to co-sign for you. Uh Uh-oh. But the friend, they understand, so they go and they co-sign. Now, I'm not recommending that, but I'm just, this is an illustration. You're going to understand it better in a moment. So they go there and they sign that promissory note and you make a commitment, you're going to pay that thing back by the next year, all right? So he agrees to stand good for you, he signs that, and so next year comes around and guess what? You can't pay the debt. Matter of fact, not only do you have that debt that you still owe, but you've added to that debt. That debt is even greater now than what it was to begin with. You've added to it. I mean, throughout that year, you couldn't pay that debt off, and you couldn't pay what you still needed because, to begin with, you couldn't pay the debt because you didn't have enough money to begin with, and so you borrowed money to pay a debt you couldn't pay. And now, you, now you st- it's compounding, you understand. It's getting worse. So you go to your friend and say, I couldn't pay that off, and so you extend it again another year. And then another year passes, and another year passes, and all the while it's compounding. You might be here tonight and say, Preacher, you're, you're talking about my life. I'm not trying to. You know, people that have credit cards and it continues to roll and roll and roll and roll. And so it compounds. And so somewhere along the way, though, you can't pay the debt, but that friend, he steps in again and he says this, I'll pay the whole debt off for you. How many of y'all would be having a shout and fit at that moment? I mean, would you be saying, glory? I mean, praise the Lord. All that debt you have accomplished, I mean, uh, accumulated through your life, and now all of a sudden that friend says, hey, I'm going to pay for it in full. I'm going to pay it all off. I'm going to take care of that for you. You know what? 
and they take that debt, they wipe it completely out. That's what's happened. That's exactly what happened on the cross of Calvary. When Jesus Christ died in our place, hey, in the Old Testament, the sins of the people, they were just tacked on year after year after year. Listen, those sins were never cleansed. They were only covered. Understand that. They were never cleansed. They were just covered by the blood. It was a picture of what was going to happen. It was a foreshadowing of what was going to happen. They were pushed forward every year. But then Christ came. He made a once for all payment. And when he did, our sin debt was paid in full. My sin debt. Hey, listen, that's a far greater debt to have paid in full than some money I owe to some bank. Jesus Christ paid it all for us. It was a one-time thing. Hey, in the Old Testament, it was repetitive, but it was also reflective. Look at verse number 3. Notice. It says, but in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. A remembrance. They would remember those old sins every single year. They would remember them. In verse 2, it talks about the conscience of sins. Did you know that God, the Bible says that, that you have a conscience? God says it. God has given us a conscience. What is a conscience? A conscience is, a, is, is um, it's hard to define, but it, it's, um, basically it's a kind of that alarm that goes off in your soul when you do wrong. That's what's supposed to happen. Conscience is that faculty of our soul which lets you know what, what, when you've done something wrong. Somebody has said that the conscience is what makes you tell your mom that what you've done before your sister tells her. That's good, isn't it? I like that. <laughs> you know, I think the best definition, probably better than that one, uh, it, that I've ever read is in Romans chapter 2, verse 15. Notice it on the screen if you would. It says there, which show the work of the law written in their hearts. You know, God has written the law in the human heart, His law. He has written it in the human heart. You see, we know in our hearts that murder is wrong. God has put it in our heart. We know in our hearts that lying is wrong. If if we didn't know lying was wrong, why would we lie to cover it? Think about that. I mean, immediately when a kid is caught lying, what do they try to do? First thing, they try to lie their way out of it. Why? Because they know it's wrong. It's something that God has put in the heart. We know in our hearts these things. God's law is written in their heart. Look at the rest of that verse. It says, Their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else accusing one another. God is putting it in our heart. Your conscience is that divine witness of God in your heart that either accuses or excuses your actions. Either excuses or accuses your actions. And when we sin, what happens? What happens when you sin? We get a guilty conscience. We carry that guilt. We have guilt in our our hearts. And when we violate God's law, we get a dirty conscience. In the Bible, it talks about a defiled conscience. Sin, it literally stains the conscience. That's why there, there had to be a radical remedy for sin because sin is a radical matter. It's a radical thing. It makes deep stains in the heart of of man's heart. It stains the literally man's conscience. And those sin stains and that guilt conscious, that guilty conscience every year when those worshipers in the Old Testament would come and go through the whole ceremony, it would just bring up all the, the back the back things, the back sins up to their minds, their guilty conscience once again, and it would just tell them that they're a sinner. It would once again reiterate the fact that they were not righteous, that they were sinners. Hmm. You know, somebody has said, let your conscience be your guide. You know, that may not be a, a very good idea, though. You say, why? Because but God has written it in our heart. Why shouldn't we let our conscience be our guide? Because, you know, the Bible also says it's possible to have your conscience seared with a hot iron. To literally have it seared. It's possible that you can grow callous over uh, bad things in your life. You know, when people start off young and they sin, their consciences accuse them when they're young. But you know what? Uh, that's, that's called guilt. They're guilty. That their conscience, it, it really it l- accuses them and they feel that guilt. But if they persist in that sin, if they keep on going in that sinful direction, then, it, then, then if they are not very careful at some point in time, literally, they literally sear their conscience. They lose feeling of that thing. That's why a person can be... I mean, the first time a person commits a, a really bad sin, 
what we call bad sin. All sin is bad, but you understand something that we know that's not right. There's no doubt about that. It really makes us feel bad. The first time, you know, it makes us feel bad. And the second time, it gets a little easier and a little bit easier and a little bit easier and a little bit easier. We all knew from the beginning that it was wrong, but eventually we get so callous to it that we don't even recognize it anymore. Our hearts are so hard, we don't even see it any longer. We have lost the feeling. And we're able to do things without a, literally with a twinge of conscience or feeling of guilt for what you've done. And then that person, uh, then they say, well, everything must be fine. I don't feel guilty. No, it's not. There's some people that can do some horrible things and feel just fine about it, but it's because they've seared their conscience. It's because they've done it over and over and over and over. I'll tell you what, it's a really bad thing to be able to sin and not feel guilt. You get to that place, you're in a bad spot. I don't want to be there. I want my heart broken. I want my heart so soft that when I commit sin, that God, He speaks to my heart and the conscience that was within me, that He has written His law within my heart, that it just screams out and it causes me to want to repent of that and turn away from that. And so, you see, because of our sin, though, as we move on, we, we need a sacrifice. We need more than they had in the Old Testament, too. And look at verse number 4. He says there in verse 4, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. It's not possible. In other words, well, um, um, we should deal with the cause of that guilt. We should deal with that. Deal with the cause of it. Not all the blood on the Jewish altar slain could give the guilty conscience rest or make the sinners whole. It couldn't do it. They still had that guilt. Only Christ could take care of that. Only Christ could deal with the cause of that guilt. The Old Testament tells us how that the, the once for all sacrifice was expected. It was expected. They were looking forward to it. And now in verses 5 through 10, he tells us how this once for all sacrifice was established. It was established. How did God carry this sacrifice? How did he do it? Look at verse number 9. Notice there. Look at the last part of verse number 9. It says there, He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. He taketh away the first, that he might establish the second. The first was the Old Testament system of sacrifices. The second is the, is the sacrifice that Christ made on Calvary. And, and he shows us in verse number 5, down through verse number 10, how God did that. He, he is showing us how Christ came to make that once for all sacrifice. And these verses, they're very interesting because they let us go and, and it, literally we, we're able to go in on a conversation that God has with Himself. God does talk to Himself. Did you know that? I mean, we see that all the way back in the book of Genesis when He says, let us make man in our image. God has a conversation among... I don't understand all of it, but we see here a picture of a conversation that we see here that went on in the eternal counsel that God had. It's a conversation going on between God the Father and God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And from all eternity, we need to understand this, that God the Father knew that we would be sinners in need of a Savior, and there would be a need for a, 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 a once-for-all sacrifice of sin. And so in, in the eternal counsel that God had, Christ, He appears, uh, and we see that we, um, he, he literally shows His uh, willingness to come to the earth to become the one sacrifice for sin forever. That's why in verse number 5 he says this, when he cometh unto the world, when he cometh unto the world, and you jump past there, there there's a part, I'm going to show you, a body hast thou prepared me. When he cometh unto the world, a body hast he prepared me. It talks about the whole counsel of, of his book and how it's written and we understand that, but he came into the world and it says, a body hast thou prepared me. Who is he talking about there? Now think about that with me. It's Christmas time. Jesus is saying, okay, here, when he cometh into the world, it's talking about Jesus. And Jesus says, a body hast thou prepared me. He's talking about God prepared him a body. That's what he's talking about there. It's a reference here to the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, somebody says it doesn't matter whether Jesus was born a virgin or not. I'll tell you what, it absolutely does matter. Absolutely does matter. If Jesus had not been born a virgin, he could not have been qualified to be the Savior of the world. He could not have died and paid the price for our sins. He could not have paid the wages of sin. You know, listen, the wages of sin is death. And if he had not been born of a virgin, he would have been born just like you and I, and he'd been born a sinner. Huh. He couldn't have died for anybody else's sins. He would have died for his own. There had to be a virgin birth. And God, he prepared a body. 
That's what the virgin birth is all about. You know, when Mary gave birth to the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ was conceived in the womb of Mary by the Holy Spirit so that Jesus was not tainted by original sin. You know, the reason I'm a sinner is because my daddy's a sinner. Did you know that? You can tell him I said so. And the reason why my daddy's a sinner is because my granddaddy's a sinner. And one day in heaven, you can tell him that too. I'm having fun with you. And the reason why my granddaddy's a sinner is because my great-great-granddaddy was a sinner as well. You want me to keep going? No. You see, it goes all the way back to Adam. We're all sinners. We are born through the line and the lineage all the way from Adam. Every one of us are born sinners. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all fall short of God's glory. Every one of us, we are born sinners. Every one of us, we fall short of the glory of God. But you know what? Christ didn't sin because God prepared His body. Now think about it. The eternal God, He literally contracted to the narrow dimensions of a virgin's womb and so that Christ had a sinless nature and a sinless body. It's high, I can't even comprehend all of that, but that's what God's Word tells us, and I believe it. I believe it. It had to be a perfect offering for a sacrifice of sin. There could be no blemish. We, we saw that as you look at the Old Testament offerings. There was a picture, once again, of Jesus Christ. And so Christ came. There was no blemish in Him. There was no sin in Him. He, that's His virgin birth. And then it says in verse number 7, notice there. This is interesting. Notice it. I come. What did He come to do? To do Thy will, O God. Amen. I come to do Thy will, O God. That's why he came. And then look at verse number 9. It's stated again. I come, what does it say? To do thy will, O God. That's why Christ came. And then verse number 10. Notice what it says again. By the which will we are, what does it say? Sanctified. By what which will? By God's will we were sanctified. It was God's will that we be sanctified. And that's what he's talking about. The sinless life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only did Jesus not have a sin nature, but he came to do the will of the Father. And he's the only one who ever lived who perfectly did the will of the Father. He was righteous. He was perfect. He was holy. He lived a life that we could not live. Hey, do you want to be in God's will? Are you always in God's will? You see, we mess it up at times, don't we? I mean, I want to be in God's will, but there's times I'm not in God's will. There's times in my life when I don't do God's will. Why? Because I'm a sinner. And even if I say I'm not a sinner, I'm a liar. Right. That's what God's Word says. 1 John chapter 1, verse number 8. I'm a sinner. Every one of us are sinners. We cannot be in God's perfect will. But you know what? Jesus Christ was. He was in His perfect will every moment of His life He lived on this earth. He was in God's perfect will. He did God's will every day, every step of the way. Think about it. Hey, we don't do that, but Christ did. He said, I come to do thy will. I come to do it. And he followed it throughout. John chapter 4, verse 34 says this. Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. I like that. To finish his work. That we might be sanctified. To finish his work. You know, that night in Gethsemane, before Calvary, the Lord Jesus Christ, He said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but Thy will be done. He was willing to, to, to sacrifice Himself. He was willing to lay down His will to be obedient to His Father's will. He did the will of the Father all the way up to the cross. And so because he did the will of the Father, it says in verse number 10, notice what it says, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Once for all. Hey, never to be repeated. We don't have to do it over and over and over again. And God, he established this once for all sacrifice in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he has written in a book, look at verse number 7, you see it? It says, in the volume of the book it is written. In the volume of the book it is written. That's saying that Christ died on the cross to make the once for all sacrifice for our sins. And then God took that, that listen, that, that story and he put it in the book. And, and so the whole world can read it. 
Hey, do you have your Bible here tonight? Raise it up like this. You got your Bible? Here is that book that it's talking about right here. This book is all about this story we're reading about tonight. This is what this is all about. The story of redemption. The story of how we can be saved. The story of how we can have a relationship with God. The story of how God loved us. That's what we're holding here tonight. It is God's book that He has given to us. In the volume of the book, it is written of me, of Jesus Christ. Here it is. We hold it tonight. And you you know what? Our job, those of us who know that, it's, that this story is in this book, it, that, that it's our job is that we are to go to the thousands of people around us who don't know about this book, who don't know the story of this. Literally, listen, there are thousands of people that are carrying a guilty conscience around us. Look around. People today, they've got guilt in their heart. They're carrying a guilty conscience. Thousands of people, they're under the heavy load of their sin. You remember what it was like before you got saved? You remember that burden that you carried? Hey, if you don't remember, you ought to remind yourself. Where you were headed, the darkness that you had in your life, the lack of peace that you had in your life. Hey, if you don't remember the, the, the drastic difference between before you got saved and now, maybe it's because you need to get your life straightened out. Are you all with me? Maybe it's because you're, you've gone back to that old life. It shouldn't be like that, though. God has given us His Word. God has told us in His Word how that we can be free of, of guilt within our conscience, how we don't have to bear that heavy load. Hey, there's thousands of people that are feeling that guilt. They're feeling that burden. Thousands of people literally being drugged uh, or dragged down into the ungodly lifestyle, living that way, trying to find happiness, trying to fill that emptiness in their life. They don't know the Christ that died for them once for all on the cross of Calvary. Hey, listen, they don't know their sins can be forgiven. And listen, it's our job to get out there and tell them. It's our job. Hey, it's in the book. God has told us it in His book to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We're to tell them about Jesus Christ. And He tells us how the once for all sacrifice was expected, how it was established. And then thirdly tonight, lastly, how that the once for all sacrifice is explained. It's explained. Look down there at verse number 11. Notice what it says. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. He's saying here that in the Old Testament, uh, the, the way that those priests would, would go into the temple or the tabernacle, they would go in, they would do it daily, they would stand there making their sacrifices. They could never fully deal, though, with the problem of sin. They, they were standing. You see that word there? What does it say? Standing. Every priest standeth daily. They never sat down. Why? Their job wasn't done. The job was never finished for them. They, were, they would go in there. They would continue to work. Their work was never done. But look at verse number 12. Man, I like this. But this man, talking about Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Hey, listen, that day is a coming. Praise God that day is a coming. Christ is coming back. But I praise the Lord that He is sitting down. The Lord Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And, and the fact is that He is sitting there. The fact that He's there right now, it says that His... Listen, He has paid the price. It was once for all. He did it. He paid our price. He doesn't have any more work to do. He has paid the price. That, that job is completed. Look at verse 14. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Wow. Are you sanctified tonight? I mean, are you sanctified? You know what that, do you understand what that means? That means that you are set aside. You are God's special child. You are God's child. You have been sanctified. You have been set aside. You have been set aside and literally the righteousness of Jesus Christ has been imputed upon you. God looks at you not as what you were, not as that sinner that you once was. Hey, listen, He looks at you right now as a child of God, one that has been washed by the blood of the Lamb, one that is covered by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He sees you positionally right now as totally sanctified. Total sanctification. You see, in verse number 14, notice what it says. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. And then he says there, you know, reminded, reminding us of what he said on the cross, it is finished. Look at verse 15. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, 
For after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds will I write them. Now he's repeating what he's already said here earlier in the chapter. He says, I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds and I will write them. Hey, listen, when you were born again, you got a brand new nature. When I was made alive spiritually, I received the Holy Spirit of God. That's what made me alive spiritually, by the way. He quickened me. He made me alive spiritually. You got a brand new nature. And God, He writes His laws in your mind so that you might learn it, so you might be able to understand it, so that you might understand and comprehend the Word of God. And God puts His law in your heart that you might love it. He puts it in your mind and in your heart. And that's what the new birth does for you. I, you know, I heard about a new song. I, I read the title last week. I like the title of the song. Let me share the title with you. I won't share the words, but it's this. I've had one birth I can't remember and one I can't forget. Does that sound like a good song? I've had one birth I can't remember and one I can't forget. Do you remember the day you were born? Anybody here that can... I've heard some weird people that had... I'm sorry. Um, not weird. Um, amazing people that have the ability to remember the day they were born. I was kind of kidding around about the weird part. But... <laughs> You can remember the day you were born? The day? Oh, the date. Okay. I was like, whew. all right. There were weird people that can remember the day they were born. <laughs> you were there, I know. I've heard some people say that, but I, I, I have a hard time believing that. I mean, the day I was born, I didn't get out into this world that the doctor slapped me and made me cry and say, boy, look at those pretty lights. I didn't say that. I mean, I, I didn't say any of those things. I don't remember what the hospital looked like. I don't remember any of that. I don't remember even what day of the week it is. I'm sure I can look it up on a calendar and figure that all out. I have before. I just forgot even that. I don't remember what it was like. But I'll tell you what, I remember the day I got saved. I remember it was a Sunday. I remember that Sunday night. That's a day I'll never forget. It's a day I can't forget. It's a day that I rejoice in. It's a day that I'm so thankful that I was born again. I was made alive spiritually. Yeah, I was a child, but I don't care. I'd rather have been saved as a five-year-old child than to grow up and live my life in sin and far away from God and having guilt in my life that I would have to look back on and, 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 and the devil try to use against me. I'm thankful that I got saved young. But you know what? What happened to me at five years old as far as the miracle that God did is no different than the miracle that God did in the life of a 29-year-old or a 39-year-old for that matter. Amen. I praise God for that day. It's a day I will never forget. I will never forget that. The second birth is the one where God put His laws in my mind and in my heart. Verse 17, notice what it says. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. That's what God says. Because of what Christ did. Because of what He did on Calvary. Because of that new birth. Because of what God has done in my life. Hey, listen. My sins, my iniquities, all those horrible things that I have ever done. God says, I remember them no more. God says, I, hey, I'm just going to take those things, put them over here. They're gone. I'm not going to remember them anymore. Now, God being all-knowing, God, if he chose, he could understand and know those things. But God has said that he chooses to remember them no more. God, he removes those things. He takes them away. Why? Because the price was paid for them. Jesus Christ paid that sin debt for us. And he chooses to remember them no more. Hey, the devil, like I said this morning, he'll try to make you remember them. He'll try to bring those things up. He'll try to throw them in your face. Sometimes your old flesh will do it too. He'll try to, hey, you know this old flesh will try to remind you of how terrible you are so it can go back and do some of the terrible things you did? Because the old flesh wants to do those things? That's why you've got to die daily. That's why this old flesh needs to be dead. That's why you've got to be crucified with Christ. That's why we have to die. We have to make a choice who we're going to be and whether we're going to be the new man or the old man. Who we're going to feed. You feed the old man, you're going to be getting the old man. You feed the new man, the old man dies. You've got to feed the right thing. This coming year, I would encourage you, feed the new man. Feed the spiritual man. Eat spiritual food. Don't be eating the carnal things of this world because that old man's going to get stronger. You mark it down, it's going to happen. But listen, God says, I remove them. I remember them no more. I remember them no more. Look at verse number 18. It says, now where remission, it's talking about forgiveness, of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Has your sins been forgiven? Amen. Mine have. There's no more need for an offering of sin. It's done once for all. Right. 
It's finished. I don't have to somehow work again for it. It's done. I don't have to somehow make sure I'm in church every time the doors are open so I can be saved. Now, God says not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a matter of some is. God wants us to be in church, but that's not why. I don't come to church so I can get saved. I come to church because I am saved. I come to church because I am a new creature. I, I come to church because old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I want to grow. God's put something in my heart that makes me desire this right here. I want to learn. I do love him. I do love the brethren. That's what God's word says happens if we're a child of God and we're doing what we're supposed to do. We love one another. The people will see that we're his disciples by the love that we have one for another. Hey, I want to keep his commandments. Why? I love him. And when I don't keep his commandments, man, it, it, the Holy Spirit immediately speaks to my heart. I know I've sinned. I've broken God's law. And it says there now where remission or forgiveness of this is, there is no more offering of sin. He's saying we don't need to offer sacrifices. It's been done. There is forgiveness. Now, I want you to do something with me. This is awesome right here. I want you to tie verse number 18 back to verse number 2. Let's look at it. Look at verse number 2. It says, no more conscience of sin. No more conscience of sin. It says, for then would they have ceased to be offered because that... The worshipers once purged should have no more conscience of sin. That means that their conscience would be completely cleaned to where they would not be carrying guilt of sin any longer if those sacrifices actually did the work it was supposed to do or the work that, that some say it would do. But it didn't do that work. That was just a picture of what was going to happen in the future. Now look at the good part. Look at verse number 18. Now where remission of these is there is no more offering for sin. Now, what's that talking about? There's no more guilt of sin. There's no more guilt of it. There's no more guilt. Hey, as a child of God, I, don't, I shouldn't be walking around with carrying guilt of sin any longer. My sins have been forgiven. My sins have been forgotten. They're no longer on my account because that account was settled a long time ago there on Calvary when Jesus Christ died and he said, it is finished. Hmm. There's times in my life when I walk around with guilt. You know, God doesn't want us to live like that. God doesn't want us to carry that. God wants us to be set free. Do you remember the day you got saved, how you felt? Do you remember that day? You remember that? How that God forgave you of your sin? How did you feel? Anybody want to just raise their hand up, share it with me. Share it with us tonight. How did you feel the day you got saved? How did it feel for you? Do you remember that day, Brother Brent? Stand up and let us all hear you, man. How'd that feel? Somebody else, I want to share how you felt that day. And just because you can't remember all this doesn't mean you're not saved. But I, I just, I want you just to share if you've got that, if you want to share that. Barb? Sage, why don't you stand up and say it loud so we can hear you, bud. Amen. How'd you feel today? Let's get some more adults. What else? Free. Amen. Free. Set free. Yes, sir. Clean. Free, clean, weight lifted, burdens lifted. Excited, happy. Joy. Amen. Love. God's love. 
great and awesome. All right, we're talking about the burden that was lifted. We're talking about the fact that we were sinners on our way to hell. We're talking about being condemned under the wrath of God already. And that moment that you received Christ as your Savior, you were set free. Set free. Now let me ask you, do you feel that way right now? Now don't answer out loud, but do you feel that way right now? Do you realize that what God, that's, what, that's what God intends? God intends for us to be able to live each moment and every day without ever having any guilt. And if you don't feel that way right now, why? Is it because we have to go and redo what Christ did on Calvary? No. This is something we need to be very careful of. There's some that wanted to try to add in the fact that we have to get saved once again. When, when a person feels guilt... We don't have to feel guilt. We can say, praise be to God, my sins have been forgiven. But we also ought to acknowledge the fact that if we have sinned, that we need to confess our sins. Not, not so we can be saved once again, but, but so that we can have a right relationship between us and God. You realize that God, He wants for us to walk in the newness of life when we get saved? It's a new life. The old life has passed away. He wants for us to live with that burden lifted at all times. You know what? That's the way I want to live my life. This coming year... I don't want to carry any weight of sin. That sin that so easily besets us. I, I don't want to give in to that. I want to have victory in Christ. You know, oftentimes when a person feels guilty, it causes them to, to, to act a certain way. Many Christians today, they are living their life in guilt. They are doing what they do out of guilt. We ought not do what we do for, 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 because of guilt. We ought, to, we ought to be the happiest people in the face of the earth. We ought to walk around like, man, I'll tell you what, we couldn't have a better life than this as a child of God. We, we ought to make it to where literally that people see the joy of the Lord and they see it in us. They see the fact that we have been set free. And as they look at our life, they say, hey, I want that. As a living epistle, they read us. They ought to see that life. They ought to see it in us. They ought to see that we have been set free from that bondage. You know, I read some time ago of a, a Christian um, psychologist that said that the problem with modern psychology is that it can't treat the symptoms of guilt. Um, it, excuse me, it can treat the symptoms of guilt, but it can't treat the cause of guilt. Think about that. It can treat the symptoms, but it can't treat the cause. Modern psychology can cover over the guilt of that sin, but it cannot remove that sin which has caused the guilt. Think about that. That's why we, we look at people today that they have such problems. It's because they can try to cover the thing over. They can take a pill. They can go to this person and try to make them feel good. They can think all these things. But, hey, listen, they still have a problem because there's still sin there. They're carrying that guilt. You know, it's kind of like a, a boy who has a, a motor on his truck that is knocking. Okay, that car is knocking. And so what does he do? Instead of fixing the motor, he goes out and he loosens up the fender a little bit. So that while he's driving, the fender knocks more, makes more noise in the motor, so he doesn't hear the knocking in the motor. What kind of, what good is that? That's not fixing the problem. That's not going to the source of the issue. All he has done is covered one problem with a bigger problem. And what you need is not to just get the symptoms covered up. What you need is the Lord Jesus Christ who can go to the depths of your heart and deal with the sin problem in your heart. You see, when you do and you get forgiveness for your sins... You know what he does? He takes away that old guilty conscience that you have. What, do you, what kind of conscience do you have right now? Christian, what kind of conscience do you have? God's word says that it's possible for me to have a conscience that's completely free. That's what God's word says. God's word says that, hey, listen, we don't have to worry about a sacrifice over and over and over again where our conscience can never truly be cleansed, can never truly be without guilt. We can have that. We can possess that right now. It's something that we should possess as a child of God. Do you believe that tonight? Amen. God wants us to have a clean conscience. He has done all that's required. We can have a clean conscience between us and God when we talk about positionally because we became a child of God. Positionally, we are sanctified. But God also practically wants for us to live a life that is holy and acceptable unto God, which is his re our reasonable service. He wants for us to live a life that's not conformed to this world, but that we be transformed by the renewing of our mind, that we might prove that which is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. God wants for us to live our life and for our life to be a life that is a life of holiness, 
a life that has been transformed by the Word of God. As God, He writes His Word within our heart, within our mind. As we learn His Word, God wants for us to have a clean conscience. God wants for us to not carry around sin in our life. What are you carrying right now? Maybe you're carrying the, the guilt of sin because you've tried to be good enough to get to heaven. You're going to continue to carry that guilt. I talk to people, knock on their door. Hey, do you know 100% sure that if you died that you'd go to heaven? Most of the time they don't know. Most of the time they don't. They say, well, I hope so. You know, many of them, they think that they're going to take the good and the bad and weigh it out. Hey, listen, if that's what you're planning on and hoping on, you have no hope. The only hope that man has in order to have their conscience cleared, to have the, sin, uh, the guilt of sin removed, is by trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ on Calvary. Because he died for us and he did it. And he did that job and it was once for all. It is finished. It is done. All we have to do is to receive it by faith, what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us. We received it the day you got saved. If you're here tonight, you're a born again child of God. You know what? We also need to receive the fact that our sins are forgiven after we get saved. But don't let the devil rob you of the joy. Don't walk around with guilt. Be free. God wants us to be free. He's done all that's required. We just simply accept that. Let's all stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed tonight as we pray. Lord, we thank you for who you are. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, and preparing the way, making it possible. Jesus, we thank you for being willing, being willing to die in our place. Lord, we thank you for the finished work there on Calvary that, Lord, you finished it and it's done. It's once for all. Lord, I praise you for that. Lord, we don't have to go back to a shadow of, of something that did happen. Lord, we can look back to it and have the, the, the real thing of what you did for us. The blood that was shed was shed for our sins, for our forgiveness. Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, I pray that you...